Oh, Maybe. good. Excellent. Well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, you are at the special Q&A for fall winter uh, session of virtual gardening series, and we have quite a few six whole master gardeners here to help us out. My name is Darby Love and I am coming to you from Nanaimo on Stananas and Stanaima First Nations territory. And um, just take a minute, especially on this, the stat from the new holiday from Saturday, Truth and Reconciliation Day, to think about what territory you are coming from. You can put it in the chat if you want, or just think about it to yourself. And thank you so much to our Master Gardeners. Thank you for Island Master Gardeners Association has been so um, generous with their time and allowing themselves to be videoed and things to bring you all of this great information over the last few years. And um, a special thanks to Joanne Canning or Joe Canning for uh, making this happen. Joe makes lots of stuff happen, which is great. And Richard Bernier for being the coordinator this year. That's a lot of people to wrangle and lots of presentations to create. So we're really grateful for all the time and effort you put into these sessions. Just a few housekeeping items. We are recording the session, but the only folks who um, are going to be recorded are myself and our panelists. Um, so nobody's image or personal information will be included. We're going to be asking questions in an anonymous way. So lots of people have been using the chat. Um, if you can, if you could use the Q&A um, with the two little speech bubbles on probably the bottom of your screen and use that to ask your questions, that would be fantastic. And we'll get the uh, most suitable person to answer them for you. And... Uh, yeah, normally we have a big presentation, but today we're just going to do it like Brian w Minter on the radio and answer all your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to, uh, Richard to introduce himself. Okay, my name is Richard Bernier. I'm a certified master gardener. I have been since uh, 2020. Uh, enjoy gardening uh, since I was a teenager. Uh, my particular um uh, hobby is um semi-hardy house plants and house plants orchids hoyas uh cycads jades you name it anything that will go outside and come back indoors also i'd like to before we really start in the seminar i'd just like to do a little uh blurb this seminar is the property of vancouver island regional library vancouver island Master Gardeners Association, and its intent is for educational purposes only. Commercial use of all or part of the seminar or its contents is prohibited without express consent from Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and uh, Vancouver Island Regional Library. This information in the seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of Vinga's knowledge. Use of information is in this seminar is sole is at the sole discretion, responsibility, and liability of the user. Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of Master Gardeners Association of BC, uh, a member of the International Service Organization of specially trained volunteer teachers dedicated to stewardship of the environment. Master Gardeners work in partnership with private uh, public sector agencies, garden clubs, uh, non-profit uh, service organizations, private enterprise to teach and promote science-based, substantial, uh, sub sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. So let's go to Joanne. Ah, I'm I'm uh, I'm Joanne Canning. Um, I've been a master gardener now uh, for about twenty-eight years. Um, I tried to get early parole, but they kept pulling me back. So there we go. Um, I love geophytes, in other words, bulbs. And um, also um, concentrating a lot on uh, small uh, plot urban gardening, both ornamental and vegetables. And um, so if there are questions about those things, I'll be happy to answer them. 
and uh, that's all the news that's fit to print here. <laughs> okay, Chris. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as you can see, you can see my name there. Um, I live in Nanaimo. I have uh, half an acre of uh, garden, and I like most people here in this group, even though we may specialize in one area, we all love to garden and it doesn't matter what plant it is. <laughs> so, but I, I have a particular love for rhododendrons and have been involved in the rhododendron world for many, many years, been a master gardener for 10 years. Jackie, Jacqueline. Hey, that's me. All right, Jacqueline, go ahead, oh, Jacqueline. Did you say Dorothy? I'm sorry. No, oh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Shirk. I've been a Master Gardener since 2010, and I started my Master Gardener program after entering a two-year diploma program at Guantland in Horticulture, and I remember our instructor saying to us that the best way to learn things was to learn them in more than one way. So that encouraged me to join the Master Gardeners, and it's an ongoing learning process with this group. So thank you all for coming tonight. And Dorothy. Hi there. I'm Dorothy Kieser, and I'm a dedicated vegetable gardener because I really enjoy the thought of growing my own food. And I have a very large vegetable garden that I garden in year round. Right now, it's full of uh, endives and radicchios and kales and other cabbage plants and uh, garlic will go in shortly. And so that's my expertise, although I do enjoy gardening in general. But if I can eat it, it's even better. Deborah? <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Debbie Garad, and uh, even though I'm not a longtime master gardener, I am a longtime gardener. First got the gardening bug when I was about nine. Uh, both my parents are still gardening. They're 91 and 92. Um, my area of special interest, if you will, is pruning. Uh, I really, I really love to prune. I've always loved to prune, but I've sort of finally figured out how to do it right and uh, but I also do a little bit of vegetable gardening, and I've learned a lot from Dorothy on that. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Back to Derby. Jacqueline, did you have a specialty or did I miss that? Um, well, I guess I had a landscape business for 12 years on the coast, and um, I, I consider myself an ornamental gardener. Don't ask me about vegetables. I'm a newbie. Hey, I won't ask you about vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy would... Elbow you out of the way anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ambitious that way. She likes <laughs> to tell you. Um, okay, we already have seven questions, which is fantastic. Oh, the first one is for Dorothy. Can you go through planting growth and harvest of purple spr spreading broccoli? Okay. Oh, it, purple sprouting broccoli is one of the ones that I should have mentioned as being in my garden right as we speak. Um, all these plants, of course, you usually plant in late summer and then you harvest in the spring. And uh, so what you want to do is you want to look at uh, your seeding table and to probably start them um, outside in a container and start them such that they're going to be about, oh, I don't know, 30 centimeters, maybe a little less by the time you want to outplant them. And that would be sometime in August. So I would start mine probably in June or so, and then outplant them in about August when they're nice and tall and ready to be staked. And then of course, during the winter, they just grow slightly, not so much. And then come springtime, they really shoot up. And then they make all these lovely little side shoots that are purple. They're beautiful to look at. And they just keep on coming and you can uh, pinch them off and eat them and eat some more the next day and the next day until you're truly sick of, uh, truly sick of having purple sprouting broccoli, but they also freeze well. I think the real thing is to make sure that they're big enough by the time they go into the ground. And when I do plant them, I make sure that they have a nice, bed of friable, lots of composty soil 
I usually put a little bit of um, ground up eggshell into the planting hole because all cabbages like a fair bit of calcium. And the other thing is I put some complete organic fertilizer in. And there's various ways you can do that. You can look at some of the books for recipes for complete organic fertilizer. I'm a bit lazy that way. And so I buy uh, 444 organic Gaia green fertilizer, not cheap, but if I put in, you know, a couple of tablespoons in each planting hole, it's well worth the expense and the effort in terms of doing that. So, uh, so that's my recipe for planting purple spreading broccoli. You might want to put a collar around the stem because otherwise some of the climbing um, leaf chewers and whatnot might get to you. But you can also just keep checking on them and take off any of the uh, climbing caterpillars that would chew your leaves. But other than that, they're pretty easy to grow and um, go for it. It's a lovely vegetable to have. Indeed. I, I planted it upon your recommendation and really enjoyed it last season during those lean, hungry sort of months. Cool. Yes. And it is, and it is in Europe called the hungry gap. That time, that time uh, after the uh, bone moon of January through the first spring moon, when there's not a lot and uh, purple sprouting broccoli is right in there. Okay. Recommended by two master gardeners at least and one librarian. So you should all <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Great. So let's just grab this one in the chat um, in case we lose it. This one's for Richard. How do I prevent the critters who are in my outdoor house plants from coming inside in the winter? Uh, the best way of actually doing it is uh, isolating the plant outdoors. Uh, and actually looking closely at all the leaves on it for any scale. Scale is a little insect that actually adheres to the leaf or the uh, petiole. And uh, it's white, it can be white or it can be uh, dark colored. Also look for aphids, spider mites. Don't forget to look in the soil also because you could bring in uh, pill bugs all kinds of other little critters inside. My suggestion to you is water the pot fully, uh, let it really soak to get rid of all the critters that are inside the pot itself. Then actually uh, give it a good spray with water, like a good strong spray with water. And then uh, use a um, insecticidal soap do follow the instructions on the the bottle it's quite important um apart from that when you do bring it in isolate it don't put it in the middle of your tropical garden in your living room or your bedroom or wherever put it in a room where it can be by itself so that you're not risking uh bringing any critters into the the rest of your uh, your house plants your green it, babies it, it certainly does. It certainly does make a difference. One year, I I had a, a three foot jade tree that lived outside, uh, and I neglected, brought it in, came into the master bedroom about February when the sun started coming through the window, and the whole wall was covered in ladybugs. I just I had this red wall, and they all came out, and it was too cold outside to take them. To take them out, they they would have died. Um, so it was a conundrum. Hmm. Ladybugs otherwise sound very pleasant. Well, they are. They eat aphids. Well, they're aphids. really they're really important. Yeah. I was tucking them into warm, protected places for weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your little ladybug babies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Richard and Joe. Um. Our next question, the question is, what vegetables, fruits, and nuts are native to Vancouver Island? Mm. Well, there are, there are a lot. There are but, quite a lot, indeed. Yeah, and the first, the first caveat that I would say, with everything except berries, is leave them alone. Um, foraging is wonderful. Um, and very, very, very few of our native plants are poisonous. Um, 
we do have the wonderful toadstool mushroom, but by God, it, it is so obvious. Um, but um, some of my friends who are uh, mushroom pickers uh, attend their club um, dinner in the autumn, and it's called the Survivor's Feast. So, you know, you, you, you need to know ahead of time. And there are lots of things like wild vanilla that, yes, you can use, but it's never going to come back there after you take it out. And it's only half as strong as a Mexican or Madagascar vanilla. So don't do it. It's probably, Dorothy, don't you think that it's the berries that um, Absolutely. are really the feast here on the coast? Yes. I mean, there's so many, whether you're talking about salmon berries, which are wonderful, um, the thimble berries are my favorites. And then if you really want to make a good pie, use Saskatoons. Saskatoons or uh, Indian pear or any other name to the same berry, purpley blue ripening in August on good sized bushes usually are just wonderful pie material. So no shortage there. I mean, you do have to compete with the birds and you have to think, you know, are you taking food away from the birds? But I think a little harvesting of any of those berries, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I cannot think, I mean, I know we have native um, hazelnuts, um, the beaked hazelnuts, but um, I don't think they make much of a fruit. And I would certainly leave that for the squirrels and the birds and that sort of thing, and rather go to one of the hazelnut orchards that would sell you hazelnuts. Other than that, like Joe says, I would never dig anything out from the wild. Mushrooms, yes. I personally enjoy hunting for chanterelles, but that's about it because I can recognize those and I know they're not poisonous. But beyond that, I would leave things alone. And the one thing about berries is that um, some of them, if you try, they, you, they may not taste very good. Um, and we have, we have uh, only one berry. And it's very easy to identify. And that's the snowberry. And it is white. And you don't eat that. Um, everything else, give it a try. If you like it, eat it. Yeah. And when I was a child growing up on uh, on the coast here, the trailing the trailing native blackberry, the very low one that trips you up, uh, is is delightful. It's it's actually it was preferable for us to pick that than than the, uh, the Himalayan introduced blackberry. So, if you're lucky to find a patch of those somewhere where things have been logged, uh, that's the best place to to look for those. Uh, I and they are to, tasty. And I agree absolutely with that. I grew up eat, picking and eating those blackberries. I've actually found a patch near where I live and I still pick those berries every year. They are absolutely the best. Amazing. They're, yeah. They're and they're an important colonizer um, in disturbed areas. And uh, um, so don't don't rip them out when you pick. <laughs> and, and they will spoil you for all other blackberries. You, oh, you really? You don't want to bother with the evergreen and the, the invasive ones if you've had the little wild ones. They're so much better. <laughs> so, Richard, you had a comment? Uh, the only comment is uh, the um, West Coast Salish people had eight, quite a few uh, plants in uh, on Vancouver Island but please leave those to the natives they know exactly what plants to eat and like camas they're the the tuber is excellent to eat uh, but there is a false camas which is poisonous and they look very much the same so please be careful and if you don't feel comfortable uh, don't eat it yeah. There, yeah, there's also an author who has written several books about native plants that were used by um, our uh, indigenous people. Um, her name is Nancy Turner, uh, and and her books are really excellent about all of the the native plants that uh, are available in British Columbia, all across the province. So, and you really can't go wrong with the uh, the plants of the Pacific uh, Coast um, by Pojar and McKinnon 
one of the things that I really like about about that book is that it is also um, one of the best um, ethno uh, bi bi biology uh, references because in almost every plant they will tell you how it was used traditionally. And so it's kind of a double education. I've just popped the link in for all of our rural library books uh, by Nancy Turner, and there are lots. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, one of the berries we didn't talk about is salal. And certainly from a native perspective, that was one of the key berries for winter food, pounded with some bear grease into uh, sort of uh, dried stuff that you could keep all winter and you could travel with it and lovely and the vitamin C is in there. Boring, but very edible. The, the yeah, thing about okay. Salal though, that's wonderful is that you'll have years like say, I love the red huckleberry, um, but there are, there are years when there's not a lot of huckleberry and uh, combining it with a Salal, anything you combine with Salal, it seems to go with it. And so there were years when I was making uh, jelly and jam and uh, always threw the salal in there to get it to go further. The other uh, um, the other thing is mahonia. The berries yes. are edible also. and The organ uh, grape, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Delicious too for jelly. Mm -hmm. Oh, just the best, isn't it? <laughs> uh, nobody mentioned any wild greens. Well, again, um, there are things like fiddleheads, uh, ferns, and whatnot. Um, and it's the same caveat, Darby. Um, unless you're starving, leave them there. We have too much degradation of the wild environment. And um, there are lots of edible greens, everything from certain wild onions to, to, the, to the ferns, to all sorts of all sorts of greens, and just just leave them. Um, we don't need them. The environment is desperate for them, and learn about them, taste them, take a take a good field book, and appreciate them. Any suggestions in case um, this person was uh, coming from a, a perspective of wanting to plant them in their property? Um, I, I, I think, um, well, I think Thimbleberry Farms, uh, offer some and, um, is it Streamside as Streamside. well? Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think that now in the nurseries that I've visited from Campbell River all the way down to Duncan, you will find, um, several different types of native plants that are beautiful and ornamental. Um, we have a whole uh, a whole bunch of the dull Oregon grape and they're all turning this beautiful color. Um, and the the native plants attract the pollinators uh, uh, with say the um, wild flowering current. Um, it may not be as spectacular as its domestic uh, friend, uh, but that's your marker plant. So when it begins to bloom, you hang your hummingbird feeders because the rufous males will um, will eat on that um, and choose their territory. Also... For those of you in the Victoria area, um, the satin flower nursery specializes in native plants. Not only do they give wonderful courses on native plants and hedgerow planting and on and on, but they also have a fantastic selection. So those of you who can easily get to Victoria, I recommend going to satin flower to get any number of native plants for your garden. Dreamside, just north of Qualcomm Beach, is also, uh, it's been purchased by new owners. They've been there for about three years or so now. And they're much more open and uh, really, really growing and, and doing a great job. So I recommend them yeah. as well. Oh, great. Uh, they're not open every day. So I would yeah. actually maybe uh, look at their website and just uh, go uh, when they say they're open. It's yeah. not a place that you just drive by and drop in. 
because they may not they're not open every day of the week. Right. We have Couch and Green Community here in Duncan, and they have very nice greenhouses, very well kept, and lots of, of it's all native plants and, and vegetable starts. What's the name again, Jacqueline? Couch and Green Community. Mm. One uh, thing that we did forget to uh, add is there is an apple that's actually um, indigenous to the island. It's a crab apple. So uh, it flowers quite nicely. And uh, I've actually not ever seen any apples on it, but they all seed, so they got to. They must be some on it. Tiny, tiny, yeah, tiny, <laughs> about the size of your little finger. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never found them very tasty, and so after tasting them, I decided that I would be lazy and not bother harvesting. The birds seem to like them. Someone in the chat mentioned nettles. And yes, that is probably one of the exceptions to the native plants um, that you can go out and harvest. Um, with a, with limited um, taking because they're an absolutely essential uh, source of food for a number of butterfly caterpillars. So uh, take it easy on them. Don't take them all if you're uh, harvesting nettles. Also. And I have, yes, thanks for that, Dorothy. And I have noticed that people think they have to cut them down to the ground. Yeah. And, and you can you can leave, you only cut the, the top third, plus that it's usually, it's often branched and you don't have to take all the branches. Just mm -hmm. take a third, leave a blossom uh, and... Leave it as as Dorothy says. Leave it for the pollinators. There's plenty, there's plenty, and it makes absolutely beautiful pesto. So springtime would be the time to get it. You wouldn't want to uh, harvest it later on in the summer where it's no. actually no. Okay, not yeah. yummy. Not yummy. <laughs> Excellent. I hope that answers your question, um, participant. We have a question for Deborah. Our condo gardens have multiple large, healthy, and vigorous rosemary bushes that are crowding out other shrubs and dominating garden beds. When is the best time to prune, light to hard pruning, for these large woody rosemary? Do you have any tips or resources in, you can provide? And then she came in with the, it was Rosmarinus officinalis. Okay. Um, the, the good news is if your rosemary are big enough that they are sort of crowding out the other plants, that means they're really happy there and they're well-established and vigorous plants. The best time to prune rosemary is in the spring, just before they get ready to put on new growth. But you could also prune in the fall if you wanted. They're kind of everybody, all plants are kind of slowing down for the winter and not really growing. And if you wanted to prune now, you could, and then they'll be ready to go in the spring. And with a rosemary, you can prune a third or even up to a half and just whack it right back and it'll come back. Um, I would recommend um, don't, don't do sort of a hedge pruning on it because then you're just going to get this explosion of puffy growth on the ends. But start with the, 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 the branches that are the longest that are sticking out the farthest that you don't like. Take that branch and follow it all the way back to its point of attachment and cut it off and then do that again with another one. And when you get to the point where most of the plant has the size has been brought in to what you're looking for, then you can do a little bit of tip pruning on what's left. But you can take it back up to a half and it'll be fine, especially a plant that's well-established and happy where it is and growing vigorously. And if it's not uh, um, being fertilized uh, with anything, if you're growing it organically, um, don't forget, collect the stems, wrap them, hang them upside down, and then take them to your local farmer's market um, or offer them at a plant sale. And um, it's, it's lovely food and uh, um, crushing them into potpourri as well. Yep. Wonderful. Oh, sorry, Deborah. did you have a- oh, just said, that, that's great. Thank, thanks for that, Joe. Or use them in your stuffing. Yes. 
Yes. Oh, on lamb. Oh, yes. <laughs> or, or or roast potatoes roasted with garlic mm. and rosemary. Oh, yes. Very, very nice. Uh, Jamie says they make a nice addition to wreaths, which I was just thinking too. Oh, that's a great idea. That's right. Great idea. I stick Particularly if you're pruning in the fall. Yeah. I stick mine in the chicken coop too. Is it? It's good for them and it smells better. <laughs> <laughs> Too much for your potatoes or whatever. Question, Lindsay. Now I have a strategy with my rosemary plant too. Okay. Louise um, is asking, oh, first she says thank you to everyone for this series of presentations. And her question is, what are you changing in your gardens to respond to the increasingly hot, dry summers? Should we just go through everybody for this one? Sure. With, uh, Jacqueline? What are we what? Uh, what are you changing in your gardens to respond to the increasingly hot and dry summers we've been having? Mm. Well, I'm limited by what I can plant in my garden because of the deer and the elk that come through and can't have a hydrangea unless it's somewhere that they just eat them. But um, plants I, I like, like uh, ligularias and um, hydrangeas also. Uh, I was trying to think of something else right now, but just plants that are real water hogs are going to be just a frustration. Whereas plants like sedums, and there's so many varieties of them, um, do quite well in dry in dry earth but some plants just just need they just wilt and weep if they don't have water almost every day so that would be a change that i would make great thank you chris and then deborah uh well i know for myself like because i grow a lot of rhododendrons which do require water um i think what i've been doing is looking at what plants need water the most and uh giving them away <laughs> and and growing other things so i'm certainly diversifying a lot more because i've learned a lot more about uh having a huge variety of plants to encourage our pollinators but um so so that's that's something that i'm doing is really having a look even though for example the genus rhododendron there are so many different types of different species and certainly many 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 thousands of hybrids that there are some that are certainly much more drought tolerant than others so talk to people talk to people who know the plants well and and if, if it's a particular plant that you that you really want to grow see which cultivars are more tolerant of a lot of sun and heat than others yeah, I think you could probably talk to some uh, people who specialize in rotos who actually, if you know somebody who has a specialty with rotos, you can always ask them. Or if you wish, you could actually talk to uh, the Gardening Advice Line right. at Milner and Gardens. The other thing that I was just thinking that that and I, that's, we encourage people to do is to mulch. Make sure that um, you either have live mulch, you know, ground hugging plants to keep the, the ground covered or to make sure you mulch to keep the, the moisture in the soil and to feed the soil at the same time. So mulching is, I certainly do more of that than I have in the past. Great, Deborah. Um, well, much like Chris, I'm, uh, being more careful about what I plant. Um, my house and yard are only five years old, so it's still sort of a work in progress. So I still have, I can still make choices and decisions about new plants because I still have space. So being more conscious about choosing things that are drought tolerant, first of all, mulch is absolutely key. I saw a huge difference in the uh, way my garden responded to climate the year that I got enough arborist wood chips mulch to mulch everything that everything just was happier everything in my in my garden is happier um be careful about the kind of mulch you get however uh if you get bark mulch which is pretty readily available and not very expensive there, there are two problems with bark mulch number one it's hydrophobic which means once it's dried out it repels water 
so it's really hard to re-wet it so you can actually you know take advantage of of uh, when you do water your plants number two it's a bit like fast food for your plants uh, it's a bit like because of the it, it there's not a lot of nutrition in bark mulch to feed your soil the very best mulch is arborist wood chips which is basically just plants stems leaves twigs everything all kind of ground coarsely ground up that will really feed your soil and it will last probably three, four, five years before you need to replace it. But if you can mulch, that's the single best thing you can do. <clears throat> the other thing, which is probably not an answer for everybody, is that um, if you can set up sort of a, a irrigation system that does uh, drip irrigation, just spot watering a plant so that you're not sprinkling overhead, you're not spraying water in places where it isn't needed you're watering right in the where the plant needs it that's the other thing is that is that i have a, a drip irrigation system in my yard because fortunately i have a very handy husband who's built it for me so yeah i'm someone, really someone just asked where you get wood chips and um uh when my when i was keeping a big garden um i would go down to the local nursery and i would buy the shredded bark but it was always combined with things from my own garden, as 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 Debbie says, um, the greens and the twigs and uh, all that stuff. So it was part of the mulch. And um, uh, it basically we made our own arborist mulch from it. But you can you can get fancy bark, uh, dyed bark, usually the cheapest shredded um, uh, bark uh uh just shreds um is uh is a good base for making um a healthy a healthy mulch but don't rely as as Deborah said don't rely just on it yeah I, I agree with the um the mulching and I certainly do a great deal of it but from a vegetable garden the wood chips are not all that suitable so um so I do a lot of mulching around my rhododendrons and other things, but um, I don't do it in my vegetable garden. In the vegetable garden, you can go a long way, A, by planting more sparsely. So for instance, if you're growing potatoes, instead of growing them at a foot distance or 30 centimeter distance, grow them at one and a half times that distance. And so they'll be able to suck up more of the moisture that is still in the soil. And then, of course, Debbie already mentioned um, the uh, in-ground, well, not in-ground, but the irrigation, the drip systems that make a tremendous difference. By the time you have some drip systems, say one of the spaghetti pipes with a, a hole every foot or thereabouts, or one of the bigger pipes with, with the holes in it, and putting those close to the plants or along your rows, um, and then mulch heavily on top of those pipes that really keeps the moisture in the ground so you're not wasting any and but if you do have to um, water in addition to say the drip system make sure you water first thing in the morning because otherwise the plants just evaporate it overnight and it really doesn't do them as much good as you'd like to so for instance with the tomatoes it's really important that if you do have to hand water or whatever um, uh, water them individually, then make sure you do it first thing in the morning. And not only because they make better use of the water, but also you want the foliage to stay dry. And that's especially true for tomatoes, but it's also true for other plants. So, so mulch in ground or on surface um, drip systems and then watering first thing in the morning is certainly my recipe and it works out i'm i'm on a very limited well and so i have to be careful with every drop never mind the fact that you can put your dishwater on your favorite plants you know wash dishes in a in a um, bin and then put it on your roto or on whatever else is particularly close to your heart makes a lot of difference Oh, and, and Dorothy knows her garden is like jai humongous food. It really is. And just uh, uh, to remind everyone attending, um, the Master Gardeners has a wonderful seminar on coping with climate change, where we talk about watering, creating shade, uh, moving plants, choosing different ones, 
um, creating a whole plan to stay ahead of um, this changing climate and keeping a healthy garden. So go on to the virtual gardening um, portal and uh, enjoy that seminar. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, do you use grass mulch in a vegetable garden and does it attract bugs? I use a tremendous amount of grass mulch. Mind you, I have a lot of land to cut the grass on, so that's easy to do. But I cut it before it makes the seed pods and then spread it amongst my vegetables. And it, it's tremendous. And I have no trouble with bugs. It, and eventually it decomposes very nicely and feeds the soil. So it's a very good thing to do. Um, I would definitely highly recommend putting the, the grass mulch on your vegetable garden. If I go could go a little further with, it's not only the mulch and the watering, it's about the deep root watering, especially uh, in the springtime or when you're actually just putting the plant in the ground for the first year or two. You want those roots to go nice and deep into the ground so that they become less, uh, more tolerant to drought. Also, like they, everybody has mentioned, a really good uh, ground mulch on it. Water once a week, okay? And give your ground about an inch of water. Uh, and then uh, choose plants that are more tolerant of dryness or some plants some trees in particular have deep tap roots that can tap into moisture that's so down deep that most other plants won't find it so uh, it's a combination of a whole bunch of things also planting drought tolerant uh in my new garden actually there's um I'm on a corner of uh, two streets. So on the corner to the west, I'm gonna be planting uh, a Gary Oak, which is a tree that's very drought resistant and is quite uh, hardy here on the Vancouver Island. So I'm looking at that kind of stuff. Uh, could I just add one thing that, that something Richard said made me think of this. Um, a lot of people have uh, trouble with their, or don't like their lawns going brown in the summer, which we kind of tend to do in this part of the world because there's no rain and then the lawn greens up again in the fall. But if you if you make peace with having other plants in with grass, like clover or some of the little uh, wildflowers or little other plants like plantain, uh, some of the other little wild things that bloom, most of them have a taproot and they will stay green when the grass turns brown. And anything that's in the legume family like clover also fixes nitrogen from the air and actually feeds the soil and makes that nitrogen available for your grass. So if we could all sort of change our minds about this well-groomed lawn that is a monoculture that's just grass and we could make peace with having other little plants in there our lawns would be healthier, they'd be a nicer ecosystem, and they'd also be more drought tolerant because of the tap roots of these other plants. That's a really good point, uh, um, Deborah. And uh, the thing too is people forget that our grasses are what's called cool climate grasses. Um, and they need to go dormant in the summer in order to stay healthy and forcing them to stay green and growing um, gives them a shallow root system uh, and there you'll have all sorts of problems with your lawn. Um, make yourself a sign, you know, proud to have a brown lawn. Um, uh, 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 you know, hush, uh, lawn sleeping till September. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, they need to be dormant to stay healthy. And, and as, as Deborah says, there's all sorts of things that do stay green. We have a, a related question about dealing with moss or getting rid of moss. Why get rid of it? Oh, I, I want to jump Step with it. it. This is another thing that is dear to my heart. <laughs> make peace with the moss. Okay. It's green. You don't have to mow it. It's quite lovely. My my grandfather, who died a long, long time ago, he prepared for retirement by building a house and he had a big stand of trees in the backyard and he just had moss 
growing all and around these trees. He didn't want to have to mow anything. And it was absolutely gorgeous. And it has always puzzled me why people don't like moss because it's green and beautiful. Just make Under, peace with it. Under my grandparents' uh, house, of course, it was a farm in Pitt Meadows and it was up on blocks and underneath um, it was the magic green carpet that was all emerald and, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, doesn't matter what you do unless you chemicalize that whole poor lawn you're going to have moss and um, rip it out. It'll come back. Um, as, as Deborah says, make peace with it. It's beautiful. It is the absolute low maintenance plant. You have to look at the benefits also. It's a soil cover. So yep. it does keep the soil cooler, keeps it moister. And it, uh, if rain happens to get on it, it's absorbed. It's not, it doesn't run off the ground. It actually sits there and soaks into the ground. So moss is wonderful to have in a garden. And if you have kids or grandkids, there's a really fun thing you can do with moss. Moss grows on specific substrates. So if you find the moss on a granite rock, it, it wants to be there. If you find moss on bark mulch, it wants to be there. So you take the, you say you have a fence. Ah, well then you take the kids in and pick some moss, just, you know, like a handful of moss off a tree and you take it home and you put it in a blender and you make a mush. And um, moss are one cell deep. So, um, they will grow immediately. So you get this 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 mush and you get some brushes and the kids can paint pictures or their names on the fence. And then they go out and they go spritz, spritz, spritz and keep it green. And all of a sudden you have decorative fence. It's a great way to get kids fascinated about um, growing things. And if you have stepping stones, it's even more fun because they can put their initials in. Uh, I think we have to have a session about garden related crafts. We're going to make lawn <laughs> their names in moss so far. <laughs> I can, under I can still sympathize though with people who like to have a lovely green lush grass and are frustrated with lawns but unfortunately our climate is such that we pretty well have to put up with it especially if you have shade if you have a shady area and you're trying to grow lush green grass you're you're fighting an uphill battle unfortunately unless you are using lots of iron based chemicals yeah well and isn't the other part of that 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 grass prefers alkaline soil and most of our native soils are acid. And I think moss really prefers acid soil, which is why oh, yeah. the moss thrives, uh, you know, and, and sun in some places does better than the grass because grass doesn't like acid soil very well, very much. It's uh, true. One tiny, I don't want to, I want, we need to keep going on some other questions, but there is somebody asking about buttercups. I'm guessing the answer is to make peace with the buttercups. What do you think? <laughs> oh, well, if they're talking about the native creeping buttercup, um, this plant appears when your soil is soggy. And um, so you probably have a drainage issue in that particular area. Now, I have rid um, my yard, uh, a yard that I had of buttercups, first of all, taking them out by hand and then raising that ground a little by over uh, seeding my lawn. And then creating drainage and no more buttercups. Okay. But it is an so, and if you have a low lying spot, then you either dig down and make a rain garden or pick it up and give it drainage. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, moving on to sad pear trees. I have a sad pear tree I planted this spring and it had pear trellis rust. I'm wondering if there's any recommendations to, 
for pampering the tree in the fall and winter or spring to increase its chances of survival. Thank you. Cleaned up. That's a tough one. Ground. That's a very tough one because, of course, we all know that pear trellis rust needs two hosts. The one is the pear tree and the other is the juniper. And so if there's any juniper anywhere within, oh, probably as close as a kilometer, um, you're going to be in trouble. You're just going to have to battle the the uh, the rust. And it's not a good scenario because you're not going to convince your neighbors and public gardens and whatnot to get rid of all the junipers that might be lurking around here and there. Um, in in fact, the juniper um, was I went because it was identified as the second um, host. Um, now nurseries are not allowed to sell juniper unless it's certified uh, free of pear trellis rust. Um, I did rid a pear tree of rust of pear trellis rust, but then I was out there every morning picking infected leaves. And this was a mature tree. And so I was climbing the tree every morning and picking out every leaf for the whole season. Luckily, um, my neighbors who had uh, junipers, um, when I asked them uh, that, you know, oh, it's the crazy plant lady, uh, there, here she comes, hi, Martha, um, uh, about the juniper, the woman piped up and said, oh, good, I've always hated those things. Let's take them up, put in roses. Yes. So you never know. Um, but because the, 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 because the tree is young. Yeah. I mean, I think hygiene, hygiene is absolutely essential. Make sure that as many of the leaves that show the rust get picked off, make sure there's none on the ground. Um, and then make sure that the irrigation is good, make sure that it's fertilized enough, and then hope for the best. A good fall cleanup, basically, is what we're saying. Can I add, well, that well. Can I add one thing to that, is that um, um, if I remember correctly, the question, this was a young pear tree, is that right? Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's sort of a, it's a given with plants that a healthy plant planted in the right place and that has everything it needs is much more able to fight off things like pear trellis rust or whatever. So if you have a young plant that is already suffering from pear trellis rust, one of the things I would consider is that there's some kind of stress on the plant. And the first thing that pops into my mind is that it might be planted too deeply, which will stress a plant terribly. So what I would suggest you do is go out and dig down around the trunk where the trunk meets the soil and see if you can find the root flare. This is the place where the trunk just flares out, where the roots just flare out like this. That spot where the roots just tend to start to flare out should be at soil level. And if it's below soil level, even an inch, that tree is stressed because it's interfering with oxygen um, exchange at the soil surface with the little feeder roots. And at the fact that this tree is young, and if you have it planted too deeply, you it's not too late to dig it up and lift it and yeah. lift it and plant it at the proper depth because that could be a, a source of stress making this tree more susceptible to the pear trellis rust the other thing is making sure it's planted in the correct spot if it's mm -hmm. not getting enough sun it would stress it if it's planted in um, wet soil it would stress it so make sure it's free flowing soil that you fertilize it uh not necessarily with the chemical fertilizer but with uh compost anything like that around and keep it away from the uh, the uh, root flare and it's it's probably to um it's probably going dormant now and if you suspect that maybe it's in not a good spot um, you can lift it now if it's a, a young plant, put it in a big planter for the winter where it gets good drainage and it's protected and then look again in the spring. So um, that's another option uh, as well as, as Richard said, it's got to be in the right place, particularly if it's a young plant. And has good airflow around it. Mm -hmm. like you've got too many trees by it and you're just going to ask for 
trouble because it's not going to get the ventilation, the air movement around it. And you'll get water just sitting there. There's okay. another question about fruit trees remaining unpicked. Maybe we should talk about that one. Yes, Chris point. on it. Um, so the question was, what can we do with our fruit trees that remain unpicked? Realizing, of course, it's late in the season, maybe planning for next year. Well, it, I don't know if you live in the Nanaimo area, but in the Nanaimo area, the uh, Nanaimo Community Gardens actually has a gleaning program. And I suspect that other areas, uh, whether it's Victoria or Portnay or wherever, may also have similar programs. So I would check into that because the gleaners are very happy. I'm talking about the Nanaimo ones, which are the only ones I know, are very happy to come out to your place when the apples or plums or whatever it might be are at their peak and pick for you. And usually you get to have a reasonable amount for yourself. And then they take the rest away and it goes to the food bank or it goes to the people who work at the community gardens. And of course the cleaners themselves get some. And that prevents the, the waste of fruit that could be eaten. And it also prevents all the mush and stuff that's under the tree. And that's just harboring various insects, whether you're talking about coddling moth or apple maggot or you name it. So, so do check into various gleaning programs, and I think you'd be quite satisfied with that. As I say, in Nanaimo, it would go, and you can look on the website, Nanaimo Community Garden Society. It also, also, it also keeps bears away, too. I know that I was just going to mention bears yes. are, you know, climb into the tree and break branches and make a mess, and of course, there, nobody has bears some... hanging around. <laughs> There's also some diseases with plums that if you leave the plums on the tree, it actually invites more diseases into the tree. So uh, it's always a good idea to, with, to clean up the ground around the tree with some of the drop fruit and any of the uh, fruit that's remaining on the tree. You don't want to let it rot on the tree. And we uh, we just uh, uh, got together uh, at our strata and uh, uh, cleaned out. Uh, we have a small orchard that we inherited and cleaned out all the apples and identified uh, someone someone knew someone that wanted to press some cider. They took all the seconds and uh, we distributed what we had, got everything off the ground because a hiker came by and said, oh, there's a bear in the area. And uh, uh, and then probably I've got 10 pounds we're taking to the food bank. Um, lovely, lovely apples, but it was time. You got it, you got to get rid of them. Um, fruit trees need management. They're not a wild tree. And um, you need to manage them uh, to keep them healthy, uh, to keep the environment around them healthy. And um, so you don't have bears in your backyard. It's, it's not only bears you'd be worried about, it's rats also. Oh, I forgot about the good old rats. Yes. And the raccoons. And the raccoons, <laughs> and the deer, and yeah. the bugs. Um, <laughs> the organization in the Comox Valley that will come and clean up your trees is called Lush Valley, uh, Lush Valley Food Action Net Society. And they will actually come and do that. They'll come and pick your fruit if you have too much that you don't want. And, and the Food Security uh, Society in Powell River will do the same thing. And I think there's um, also one in Qualcomm Beach, Parksville. I'm not familiar with the name of it just right now. but Jacqueline, do you know uh, anyone in the Cowichan, uh, Cowichan Valley area? Does does the uh, Farm Hub or Cowichan Green uh, do any Cowichan clean? Cowichan Green community. It might be. Yeah. Wouldn't hurt if anyone is in the area to contact them and ask. I, there's another question that gets answered that's asked a lot, and that's about raspberries, planting raspberries. Mm -hmm. Want to address that one? So uh, Sharon is asking, uh, she said, I planted raspberries in June. So now and um, I think it's no fruit this year, but canes are tall. Have heard mm -hmm. from a friend I should cut them down to six feet. And yet another friend said only to cut them in early spring. Who's right? Actually, six <laughs> inches, I think she said. Six yeah. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Cane fruit, cane fruit um, uh, grows one year and fruits on the next. 
So you manage your plants by cutting out the old canes and the allowing the new ones and allowing the new ones to grow. So um, if they planted this year, it's not unusual that they wouldn't get any fruit. Um, now I'm I can't quite remember. Um, you leave that you leave that first year, don't you? Um, it's been so long since I've uh, cultivated any raspberries. I'm I'm uh, pretty rusty on that. And then you let them fruit, and then you cut them out for the next year. Is that yeah, you, it? Yes. you cut out the canes that flowered this year? And right. So there was nothing flowered this year. There's nothing to cut out. So every year you're cutting out the canes that actually flowered that year. There we go. Well, and the whole idea of whether to to cut. Uh, the canes that are going to fruit this next year. Like I just did this with my raspberries yesterday. Oh. I went out and cut out, cut out uh, the old, the ones that fruited this year because they're already dead. In they're fact, done. I, yeah. Yeah. They're done. But if you cut them and you leave them a foot or so high, they have a hollow stem that there are some critters that will lay their eggs in or that they will overwinter in. So that's not a bad thing to do. But the rest of the, the new canes that grew this year, some of them are, gosh, two, three meters long, and they're all mm. flopping over. I just leave those for the winter. They'll drop all their leaves. And then in early spring, before they start to leaf out, I will cut them back to about chest high. And then what happens is the buds then will make new branches. And I don't know that I necessarily get more berries. I think I probably get the same number of berries, but they're easier to reach and the canes are easier to handle. And I always have lots of berries when I do that. Mm -hmm. And that's how I used to um, uh, manage my blackberries that, that, that way. And as you, as you say, Deborah, they're cane fruit. Therefore that's their, their, the way of going. Right. You can just leave them, you know, three meters long if you want, and they'll, they'll send out buds and fruits and, you know, you'll have berries. I just think the canes are easier to manage if you cut them and then they branch. So. Yeah, you can see commercial growers actually that that take those really long canes and and tie mm -hmm. them to, to long uh, wires. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't have depends how much room you have. Yeah, I don't have the space to do that. My raspberries came under the fence for my next door neighbor, so they're kind of in this corner in my yard, and I'm trying to kind of keep them in this corner. So yep. good luck. And you did. And, not and someone for asked. Them. <laughs> someone asked early on about uh, kiwi vine. And I know, uh, um, Dorothy, you you have that exquisite, exquisite kiwi um, vine over the arbor. Um, maybe you can address their question. Yeah, so this question is, um, I have a two-year-old self-pollinating kiwi plant. Vines are vigorous, but absolutely no flowers. When can I expect fruit? Year three, four? That really depends. If it's if it's a grafted plant, I would suggest that you probably get fruit in the third or fourth year. It's never it's never the year you planted it, but in the third or fourth year, if it's a grafted plant. If it's a plant that isn't grafted, but more or less grown from seed or maybe from a, you know a cutting, then it's going to be a lot longer. In fact, as Joe referred to, I do have this kiwi, but it took a solid 15 years before I saw the first flower. And then to make the story go on, I realized that I didn't have a male to go with it. And as this particular person, of course, has a self-pollinating one. So that's a different issue. But mine were not self-pollinating. So for years, I had to find a male plant and then pick the flowers and then hand pollinate all the flowers that I wanted. I got lots of kiwi, but it was also a lot of trouble. A lot of work. And I and work. I've I, and I've heard other people say, oh well it's a it's a self-fertile kiwi. Um I get blossoms, but that's it. Hmm. Yes. Right. You have to you have to think about it. But anyway, you have I mean, to, good luck with yeah. it. And and I I don't know how you could tell whether it's a grafted plant or not. But uh, but maybe time will tell you <laughs> which uh, category it belongs into. If you bought it from a nursery, they may have a better idea as to what they sold you. The other the other thing is the old adage of sleep, creep, and leap. The third mm -hmm. year, the fourth year, normally when you find some 
some more fruit at, at least more yeah. bountiful. And and kiwis are long lived, but they're notoriously slow. Oh. And uh, I know my in laws uh, was year six. They had dioecious plants. They had, in other words, males and females. And we were out there with our little brushes, you know, making baby kiwis. Um, and they finally got the idea once we showed them how. Um, <laughs> and uh, but they were, I think, they were kind of like slow witted children. But once they once they got the idea, they were fine. But it took six years. And yeah. and you have to train your pollinators. Yeah. I yes, had yeah. Oh, year. training bees is so tough. It is. You have to be as patient as Dorothy for 15 years. And you love <laughs> That's right. I had the acne, acne, acne. Oh, I had the, uh, the uh, variegated uh, kiwi. Kolomitka. Yeah. And I, I had a male and female and it just grew crazy. It was growing all over the place. It was on the arbor going into the backyard, covered it, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. It was taking over the arbor. Okay. How much fruit? Quite a bit. But oh good. They're they're only about about that big. The big yeah, they're not size a size of your little finger, but very, very tasty. Very mm. tasty. Sweetest little berries. I have a bulb question. I think it's ah. for Joe. Do I need to put bone meal in the hole when I plant bulbs? Ah, uh, yes. The perennial question and the uh, um, the old uh, the old assumption. Um, first of all, don't plant don't plant your bulbs too soon. Um, it's warm. Most of our bulbs um, grow according to the soil uh, soil temperature. So. Uh, wait till the end of, of October uh, and they don't mind freezing. Um, don't bother with the bone meal in the bottom of the of the hole. Um, first of all, a lot of people dump the bone meal in and then slap the uh, um, the bulb on top of it. And of course, it burns and they think, oh, my God, I didn't put enough bone meal in it. Uh, and it had nothing to do with it. So prepare your ground the way you would any other plant. Make, make the soil a little bit richer, but not too rich. Understand that geophytes, bulbs, carry their own storage system. They um, developed on the, on the extreme edges of their environment. So they develop two types of reproductive systems. And that's why we call them bulbs. That's an, ex, that's an extra storage system. It will bloom next year using that food. What you're really feeding in the hole, which is why you use just a good compost, is you're feeding the plant to replenish the bulb, not to bloom. Now, it's it's going to draw more off the bulb um that in in a poor ground because all bulbs also have some type of root and it uses that root as well but don't don't bother with the um with the bone meal they they don't need it um when they are finished blooming don't cut off the greenery that greenery plus the earth replenishes the bulb which is what's going to give you your blooms next year. And understand that some bulbs are short-lived. They will only really flourish for three or four years, and then they're done. But if you treat your soil right, and you don't chop off all the greenery after they've bloomed, they will make babies. And you got more stuff. I had a... Uh, um... Narcissus uh, tete tete planted in the oh, lawn. Oh, they're beautiful. In the lawn, though. And uh, it was, it actually was quite nice. It actually was a welcoming spring. My, all my neighbors loved it and everything else. And they did multiply. But yes, I would uh, not cut the leaves off right away. I would actually go around them with the lawnmower and just leave it for maybe um, a month after they flower. And then I would just go and 
took the whole thing off. And Tete Tete is a is a very old uh, variety, um, narcissus, or what what people will call the yellow narcissus. People call it called daffodils, right. and uh, lovely multi stemmed um, early daffodil, and and it will it will creep out into the into the lawn, and as uh, Deborah said, because the lawn is often more alkaline, and bulbs, uh, the majority of bulbs. Um, do well in a sunny, more alkaline area. And uh, my little Thomisiana uh, crocus would do the same thing. They're, they're the little early species crocus. And they um, are actually one of the few, because they're species, um, that will grow from seed. And so they will go to seed and then pop out and spread their seed. And they they walk across lawns and 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 they're just beautiful. And then by the time you have to mow the lawn, unless of course you're smart and have moss, um, they're finished anyway, so it's okay. We should be planting more of the species tulips, and uh, these are they're hardy. They grow year after year. They're they're not temperamental at all. And, and the other thing that I discovered with 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 my tulips, because I, I grew a lot of different types, was that the deer, there were a couple of the species uh, tulips um, that like uh, tulipetarda, which is very, very short. And it's this bright yellow center with this stark white star, but it's only about this tall. And one of the things with... Um, uh, certain types of bulbs is that their leaves are taller than the blossom. And with, with some of the species tulips, um, the deer tend to leave them alone because they have to work to get at the blossom and deer are notoriously lazy uh, and they will go on to other things. And um, a lot of species plants are just less susceptible. They're less tasty. Um, I guess, and uh, and they're beautiful, beautiful plants. The the species tulips, but your big emperor tulips—that's deer candy. Oh, they love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. I hate to cut off talking about deer candy, but we have more questions. Yes. <laughs> this, Many more. Yes. This one says, "My raised beds are done, but what should I do to stop the soil from disappearing over the winter?" Should I use leaves to cover them up or just leave them? Leaf mold is wonderful. It's wonderful for your garden. Work it into the, the soil, leave it over the winter, and it's wonderful to add uh, vegetative matter, organic matter to the soil. And I always take the extra leaves. I always take the extra leaves and put them in garbage bags over winter. Let those leaves rot. And then come spring, they're fabulous to add to your compost. What I do is I run over the, with the lawnmower. Oh, yeah. Broken yeah. up into mulch and, yeah, work okay. it into the soil. Jacqueline, you were trying to say something. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was just saying that, you know, I, yeah, I agree with uh, uh, mulching the leaves in a bag or using the lawnmower. I got a lot of big leaf maple around my property. Those are pretty big leaves. But putting those leaves just down on top of the beds, too, I think really buffers the hard rain, the hard, cold rain that really. Oh, yeah. Yes. And I totally agree. Yes. And if you if you put the whole leaves on your beds and leave them there. That's wonderful. It sheds the rain. And then in the spring, when you want it to really go into the soil, all that material, then use the lawnmower rather than pulverizing it at this point. Uh, leave the leaves whole and then in the spring, pulverize them so that they're easily incorporated into the soil. Good point. Yeah. Well, make, sure, make sure that you also, um, when you're collecting leaves and if you're going to hang on to them, make sure that they're dry when you put them in those plastic bags. If you, if you, if they're wet, they'll just form a, a mat. That's just about <laughs> impossible to get. A very smelly. And then mat. it doesn't rot very well at all, actually. No, no, it's too wet. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I would recommend not running the leaves through the lawnmower simply because you've got a lot of beneficial critters that are that are going to use those leaves, those um, fallen leaves as habitat or places to hibernate or hide, or there's egg masses of, of uh, beneficials in those. 
so if you if you can find a way to use them and leave them whole, I go out into my yard and I just rake the stuff off the grass and and kind of pile it up into the flower beds and just leave it. And it, it's way easier, first of all, it's way less work, but you also have created a habitat for a lot of beneficial organisms. That's no, you're really absolutely good right. And but the the problem is if I put them on my veggie garden, then uh, I do have to incorporate them into the soil. And so I do mow them in the spring. You know, it, it'll be definitely spring by the time I do it. But uh, but I can't deal with all the leaves that are on top. No, well, I leave it, the leaves on the, the, on the beds. But on the lawn, this is where I gather the leaves with the lawnmower. You know, raking them is, it's a tedious job. So why not just use a machine? Because and to answer that, someone's question, yes, you can use oak leaves. Oak yeah. leaves are just fine. It's a myth. Grind yeah. up the oak leaves. It's they okay. Take longer to break down. But yeah. apart from it's that, and thing. they're really good for an acid soil. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'd, I'd like to comment on on her part of her question where she talked about the soil disappearing over the winter. Um, two things I think are happening. Number one, when you have when you put compost and organic matter into your garden soil, that does decompose and kind of disappear after a while. I've watched all of my garden beds just go down, down, down. And that's the organic matter being used up and decomposed and, and used up by the plants. But the other thing, and Jacqueline said this, that I really agree, is, is if you cover all your soil uh, with some kind of mulch, you're protecting your soil from the pounding winter rains, which also compress the soil and, and are not good for the soil texture. So again, this is a type of mulch using leaves or whatever, but just mulch in general is one of the very best things you can do for your garden year round. So Nature has been doing it for years. Yes, yes, yeah. Excellent. We have a question um, from Lauren. Should I cut down my bishop's weed ground cover at this time of year? It's getting quite black and mushy after the rain and looks really terrible. Ultimately, is it better to try to get rid of it and put in something else? Is that bishop's hat? That That's a very invasive plant here. Weed. Is bishop's what... weed. Is that gout weed? Agapodium. I don't know what, what plant we're talking about. It's agapodium. Yeah, she's just saying yes. Which okay. Yeah. Is that is that the one that's invasive? Yes. It it is. Yeah. Yes. It is. Very. The, very. People do the the nursery sell the variegated one, and and I know it doesn't get into the lawn. So some people have it in areas where it works for them, but it's a terrible plant escaping into nature. It is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you I would mow it down because it does get hideous as it gets you know toward the end of the season, straggly looking. It's it's gonna come right back. Don't worry about oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> I right had some back. growing in Edmonton out uh, in a narrow spot by the garage. Never got water, never fertilized or anything else, and it grew like crazy. It was just like right. all over the place. The Can unvarigated have... or non-variegated one yeah. is definitely more aggressive as well. Yeah. Hard to get, hard to get rid of. And then she's asking what to uh, put in place and, you know, once you finally get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a shade plant for the most part. This thrives and I wouldn't even put it into the compost because even a tiny root fragment, root. tiniest yeah. of tiny root fragment can yeah. start up again. So I would put it into the uh, city compost or into the landfill or whatever, but don't put it into your own compost because you'll just make the matters worse. Right, so things like that, they usually suggest that you take it out and leave it on a tarp to dry until it's, yeah, yeah the roots are dead and then you can dispose of it. So sweet wood rough, um, is a nice little plant for shade and blooms in the spring. The only thing is it kind of goes dormant over the summer. So you might want to have something else in there. And um, if it's dry shade, what do you think of Jacob's ladder? Um would is is lovely. Epimedium. As well. Epimedium. 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 Yeah. Epimedium. Yeah. Epimedium is beautiful in dry shade. So many varieties. But but you also might think of natives, native plants that do well in shade. There's there's a lot of them. Uh, oh, wow. I, I particularly like the 
the uh, low growing, the small low growing Mahonia, the Oregon grape. I think that those are quite lovely. Oh There's yeah. A, the dull Oregon grape. Yeah. And, and, and if you have a plate, if it's not dry shade, if it's wetter, then ferns would be beautiful as well. And you can add all our native fritillaria in that in that damp shade with the ferns, and they're fabulous. Well, yeah. even the western sword fern will take yeah. a certain amount of drought, so in go, the dry shade, to, that would be good. Go to one of the native plant nurseries we were talking about and ask the people there. Tell them, describe the area, what kind of conditions it is, and ask them for recommendations for native native ground covers. And and Lindsay Lindsay's question about Pachysandra terminalis, the Japanese, the variegated Japanese spurge ground cover, same same thing, same answer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's invasive. Don't don't plant it. Don't. Oh <laughs> no, it's never mind the vincas stuff. and and other things like that. Periwinkles yeah. are equally bad. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's good. We had another question um, that you probably have covered about um, planting under a cedar tree that's older. Hoping for a plant that could eventually replace cedar. Maybe two questions. Yeah. If, if you have a big cedar tree with nothing growing under it, there's a reason for that. If you go into the forest and you look under a big cedar tree, what do you see? Moss. Not a lot. So if you want something under the cedar tree, put something like impatience in a pot. Stick the pot in the ground and you'll have it. But nothing wants to grow in there because nothing's supposed to grow in there. And that's, don't, don't fight nature. But if you want the color, put potted plants in there. Great. Yeah, cedars, cedars have very, very um, fine, fine roots, and they will even go up into inside of pots, those yeah. roots. So yeah. they're yeah. seeking water, any water that they can get. And yeah. now for our drier summers, um, unless that, that cedar is actually watered, it probably is going to die anyway. So you need to think about replacing it. And there's some fabulous sh smaller shade trees like uh, Styrax and Stewardias and um, there's there's so many lovely ones that um, that are that are perfect for for properties. Yeah, and even even some of the pines uh, are very good in uh, in drier conditions. Yeah, great, uh, Dorothy. One last one for you. How do I grow Walla Walla onions? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is, I would actually have to look that up because I find in some areas the walla wallas just don't do well and my garden actually fits into that category so I'm actually going to pass on that but maybe Debbie or one of the other veggie growers has a better answer than I do um, I can look it up and I'm happy to email the person that asked that question but off the top of my head I can't do it it feels like one of those ones that we're all supposed to be able to grow really well here. Well, that's, yeah, wow. and that's a big, that's a big assumption. Well, I couldn't it, grow what, like Dorothy, I couldn't grow Walla Wallas in one garden. And in another house, they grew just fine. They overwintered, they were beautiful. Um, I think it's it, the soil itself. Because yes. don't Walla Wallas uh, grow quite well in, is it sulfur reduced soil? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and yep. that's why they're sweeter than not as hot. Yeah, yeah. The sweet onion is it has less sulfur in it, and they don't keep uh, very no. well at all. Debbie um, had had some comment. Well, my only comment was that part of the reason a Walla Walla onion is kind of special is that it doesn't grow everywhere. It is harder to grow. You need, like Richard said, something about the soil. The soil is a particular kind of soil. And they, <clears throat> there are a number of different varieties of sweet onions. The Walla Walla is one from Washington state, but there's the Vidalia, which comes from Georgia originally. And all of those onions sort of have their little niche place of soil and conditions. And they're 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 touchier to grow and that makes them more special so yeah and i used i used to grow perennial bulb onion. 
Um, they're called mother onions. They're very hard to get a hold of. They grow on the prairies, uh, but they're perennial onion. And oh, so also the walking onion, the Egyptian walking The Egyptian onion. walking onion, the, the top set onion as well. Yeah. yeah. But they, they're very, very small. They're great for soups. But for soups someone that are, wants a big, giant bulb onion, they're not You they're, can they're use them food. as uh, chives. You can use them as uh, shallots. And they need basically no care. None. No. And one thing that I, that's a good point, Richard. One thing that I ended up doing is I stopped growing bulb onions um, uh, and stopped fighting the soil, as, as uh, Deborah mentioned, um, because they weren't growing well. And I grew and I grew shallots, um, onions I could get at the farmer's market in big bags and they were beautiful, better than anything I could grow. Um, shallots are expensive, but they're very forgiving in terms of the soil. They're like leeks. And so I would grow these exquisite French shallots and cook with them like I was a queen um, and not worry about the onions. Uh, so thing? if something isn't growing well in terms of your vegetables, try a relative um, of that plant. Yeah. And uh, um, if you're growing, you know, if you're if you're going to be growing a Calabrese bro broccoli and it's not doing well, then don't grow it. Grow something that is maybe a multi head broccoli. Um, and uh, again, we have all sorts of choices um, and you'll be happiest with what produces best and what produces best in vegetable gardens tastes best because it's healthiest. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, can we get through the last seven questions in the last three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Let's power through them. Okay, power <laughs> questions. Where can I pick different apple varieties on the island? Where can you, you say pick, pick them or where can or you grow? buy them? It says pick. Oh, okay. yeah. Hmm. Oh. This is this is a great apple year, so I'm sure there's, you know, ask on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, yeah Facebook, Facebook marketplace is a marketplace. is a good place to look. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, there's also a site called Garden Vancouver She's Island. Saying... There's that, also Jacqueline? say Garden again, Jacqueline? Vancouver Island at the Facebook page. Gardening Vancouver Island, maybe joining on Vancouver Island. Okay, yeah. there was well, another comment there. from that lady who said pick to eat mm -hmm. pick to eat. Oh. say look at some of the gleaning programs and see excellent very mm -hmm. very quick okay could a small portion of a japanese maple root be pruned due to irrigation systems in way of root do not want to kill maple yeah oh yeah you're not going to you're not going to kill it just cutting a small part of a root away no It'll, it'll be fine if you took half of the root yeah then you'd be you'd have to reduce the canopy by at least that much but if you're just cutting a little bit of the the root i don't think there'd be a problem well and and what's going to happen is the 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 photosynthesis that happens in the leaves is going to feed the plant to regrow the roots in the places that you want them to be yeah. so you, you, the tree will be fine it'll be fine I'm just going to skip to the one about junipers. Is there anything I can do ex um, except remove junipers? I feel bad that I even have them now, but they're over 40 years old. Do they always carry the uh, pear rust disease um, or health? The, the, old one, the old ones generally do, and they're best taken out. And if you like junipers, you can plant them from nurseries. And as I said, Junipers must now be certified uh, pear trellis rust free. But those old ones, uh, I bet you an acre of sheep that they uh, that they're that they're uh, a vector. Depends if you want to be a good neighbor or if you have pear trees, I guess. Yeah. Right. How do I prune lavender? Okay. <laughs> Go for it, really Zebra. Lavender is really easy to prune. In fact, it's almost you you need to do it pretty quick now. It should have probably been done in the last month. What you do is you ignore the stem part with the blossom and you look at the plant with the leaves. There's it's kind of a ball shaped, and you prune back about a third 
in a third into just the ball shaped part where the leaves are. And what this does is it keeps the lavender tidy and keeps it from getting leggy and rangy and all woody. Okay, that's that's all you have to do. And you can use a hedge trimmer, you can use pruners, you can use your kitchen scissors. I've used all of those, just whatever works for you. Pretty simple. I'd like to make a comment about lavender and rosemary because they're both considered sub shrubs and they're Mediterranean plants. And they do get woody and open as they get older. So pruning them when they're young and keeping them small and tight, compact, I guess we would call it, um, is a real advantage to the aesthetics value of the plant because it's still going to grow lavender and it's still going to grow rosemary, but they just become an ugly plant after about five years. And yeah. um, I call them a three to five year plant and replace them. Right. If you don't prune them, they do get really ugly. Mm -hmm. the, the good news is, is they're a relatively inexpensive plant. So replacing them every four to five years is not a huge problem. It's very you, available. <laughs> yeah. And very available. Right. Okay. We have three more questions. Oh, we have two more questions. Oh, we're hot. <laughs> Propagate the hardy salvias. <laughs> Propagate the hardy salvias. Yes. With cuttings. I, I, I don't know that much about taking prop propagating. Well, they're a perennial. You can usually take uh, you can usually take cuttings, but salvia are easy to grow from seed. Yeah, they are. Uh, Mine you could themselves. try chip cu uh, cuttings, but you need to keep them moist. So, in other words, you need a, uh, a misting system. You also need bottom heat. So you're looking at quite a process. So my suggestion would be divide the clump or start from seed and i had i had salvia seed themselves this last year i had mm. them coming up to my surprise so yeah chris yeah i would agree i was just looking at the yam yam uh question and um they're very well you can't grow them just out in the ground you have to start them really really early and start them from the the, the bulb itself and best thing to do is keep them in a big pot as they, they they're they're very hot season vegetables it's where they grow yeah i i had best success growing growing yams in 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 big pots and they certainly do me... very well especially in black pots because they need all the extra heat but oh, i do a lot of sweet potatoes and i can never really tell the difference between sweet potatoes and yams but if you um, let them germinate in a warm spot, moist, or in a bit of soil um, where the eyes are, then they'll make a little shoot and you can plant that shoot into a pot, small pot. And then as it grows, you put it into a bigger pot and you'll have a nice crop of sweet potatoes before at the end of the season. Mm. We do call them yams, but they're all sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. oh, the true the 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 just... actual yam is a is an African um, root, um, mm -hmm. and um, the yellow sweet potato and then the more orange one we call a yam. They're actually both sweet potatoes. Yeah, so, and and they work so well to to just uh, you know you can even cut them in half and stick them in a glass of water on some toothpicks the way you did avocado seeds in your youth. Um, and uh, and they'll make little shoots and then you can break those shoots off and then uh, they'll root in no time and start your new sweet potato plant. They always make me nervous though because they they look like bindweed, you know, yes. because they're the, well, because they're they're the same they're the same uh, family. family. And they just they just they just make me nervous to look at, you know. <laughs> well, everybody thinks they're just a kind of potato, but they're not related to potatoes at all. Uh -huh. At all. No. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Okay, so Darby. Uh... Oaks leave. Uh, the poll question that I meticulously crafted before this session about where you heard about this disappeared because I think it was just in the practice session. So could you put into the chat how you heard about this session and any suggestions for future sessions that you might have? We would really appreciate it like activist signs for your garden or growing yams, whatever. Or, you or garden crafts, garden like crafts. you suggested. <laughs> or about purple sprouting broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> or white sprouting, white sprouting broccoli, which is really 
very popular in England and where it's a little bit colder, it's more of a spring sprouting broccoli, a little sweeter. We have lots of suggestions from the panel. Lots of great answers from people on the, on the webinar chat chat line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just saying that they are uh, really enjoying this. Uh, yeah. So uh, just to let you guys know that we will be doing this again three times a year, spring and in the summer, as well as the winter. So this will become a regular thing for us next year. Also, if any of you have any uh, comments or any uh, suggestions for follow-up um, events, you can, uh, do we have a Vimga or um, a the IRL website that or uh, email that we could give? Yeah, you can email um, my branch here. So it's, uh, I'm just gonna put it in the chat, and I'm north at virl.bc.ca. Don't forget, you can also call Milner Gardens and Woodland. You can go to their website and go to the garden advice line there if you have questions. And then there's time for people to re do a bit more research and give you some really thorough yeah, answers. Because yeah. sometimes right. some of these some of these questions could take two hours to answer. <laughs> Good point. Right? That that could happen today for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the more the more feedback we get, it, it's very important to us master gardeners. Um, and that's why we have to go to school every year in order to maintain our certification that we study and know the latest scientific data coming out of the horticultural industry and out of the universities. Um, so we can answer questions that people are really keen on. And so the more feedback you get uh, get to us, the better that we can be the service club we want to be. And uh, we really do appreciate your feedback. Okay, again, that uh, email is nanaimo north at virl.bc.ca. So if you do have any suggestions uh, on a go forward, then do leave them at this email. Great. We got some good suggestions about managing soil, native native plants. Or one specific species. If you're interested in, in roses or I mean, um uh bless your heart, Chris, you're always you're always so modest and you've forgotten more about rhododendrons than I ever will know. And we have all sorts of um, experts um, on different species. Well, like with Jacqueline, having been a, a, a landscaper for so many years, in terms of managing landscapes and things like that, or or Richard um, with his indoor jungle, um, it it's just uh, uh, you know if you have a have a specific interest in a type of plant, a type of species. Um, and if we get enough of those questions, we'll devote a, a good chunk of a session to them. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I've got some uh, nice suggestions from you out of the chat. Thanks for letting us know how, where you heard about it. We do, Somebody really wants gardening undercover. Um, including me, so that would be great. <laughs> and Joe's all settled in her new place, and she can. She can uh, we'll, we'll be doing that one in the spring. Yeah, yeah, It'll be great. Thank you very much for thank your you, everyone, everybody, <laughs> and thank you again to our master gardeners for their willingness to be put on the spot and uh, be here with all of our questions. You're welcome. Enjoy thank it. you. Our recording will be available soon, and I'll email that out when it's ready. I'm a good girl.